Good evening and welcome to our program. I'm Stan Adams with the Word and Sword TV broadcast, and we are certainly glad that you've come to be with us tonight. Hope that you'll get your Bibles out and be ready to study God's Word together as we go through another study of conversions in the book of Acts. What must I do to be saved? The question that we are dealing with. What do people need to do to go to heaven? Most important question in the world. I want to go to heaven. How in the world do I get there? What am I supposed to do? We hear so many different answers today. and We're going to see what the Bible says about that in the book of Acts. Again, we are glad that you're with us. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. It meets at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. I'm Stan Adams. I used to preach there, but now I'm the new preacher at the Lincoln Church of Christ in Lincolnton and over in that area. And uh, we invite you to come worship God at any faithful congregation of the Lord's people anywhere in this area. And we certainly do appreciate your time and your effort in uh, coming in being with us tonight. You have several choices you could make about where you turn the, turn the dial on your TV, about where you're, uh, what, what button you push and whether you just keep clicking. And you stopped here, and we thank you for that. We know that's not something you had to do. But in order for you to study the Bible and uh, engage in our study together, uh, you have shown an interest, and we thank you for that. And we hope that you'll have time with your kids to uh, study God's Word and to discuss the, uh, God's Word. It's a good way to study the Bible is to get your family around the TV. Uh, it seems to be a place where people gather anyway. And uh, just get your Bibles out and study the Bible for a few minutes together before your kids go to bed, things along those lines. I know kids pretty well turn in four to nine, most of them. So, you know, turn the video games off and sit around and study your Bible. You can't go wrong with that. And again, we're going to do our best to make sure we don't disappoint you by teaching you something other than what God says. So we hope that you can rest assured that what you hear on this program will be according to God's Word. And if it is not, you would be our friend to call us and let us know. The number is 828-485-5555. And if we have made a mistake or we have, we have misrepresented what God's Word says, then you would be our friend to let us know. It's a serious thing to preach the Gospel and to teach the Gospel. God gave it to us perfectly, but man sure can mess it up. And I could mess it up. So you be sure that you keep me honest, keep me where I need to be, because I'm as fallible as any person out there. And any speaker that comes on this program is the same way. We all are prone to, make, to misspeak or to make, uh, hopefully we're not making uh, errors on purpose. But if we are, we stand under the condemnation of God whether it's on purpose or whether it's by mistake. In Galatians 1, verses 8 through 10, though we are an angel from heaven preaching to you any other doctrine than what you have received, let him be anathema. So everybody that stands in a pulpit, everybody that teaches in a public venue or in a private venue is responsible for what they teach and, what they, and how they present it. And it's important that we do it in the right way. We believe God's Word, the Bible, is the inspired Word of God. By inspired, we believe it is God-breathed, that God breathed the message into the minds of men, used their uh, individual skills and, and uh, individual uh, styles to pen and write the New Testament. And God wrote these things. It is for all from God. He is the author. But men penned it. And so we have the complete mind of God for us today. And we believe that it is all true. Now we, of course, in your Bibles today, there are study notes and things that are inserted by men. But the text of the Bible itself, the New Testament, is the law that we live under today. The Old Testament is the law that, they, that the children of Israel lived under and the patriarchal law also. So. We have the complete entire Word of God. Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 10, 23 that it's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. God knew that. And he told that through Jeremiah, he, he said that, and he said that man can't direct his own steps, so we need guidance. And we're going to talk about a man tonight called the Ethiopian eunuch who needed guidance. And he, need, he knew he couldn't direct his own steps, and he was not doing a very good job of it. So. He said, I don't even understand what I'm reading. And that can happen with a lot of people. You don't have to be ignorant. This man was certainly not an ignorant man. But he didn't understand exactly who, who was being talked about. 
And so someone came, uh, the Lord sent uh, someone up there, Philip, to teach him, and he learned the truth. And that's what we all should be. We should all hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we should all be willing to change our behaviors if we are found to be wrong by God's Word. You know, God's Word is not just a Word that we have that is a suggestion to us. It's not just something that we can say, well, I've read that. You know, it's possible to read something, not understand it. You ever read directions and put something together wrong? But you thought that you were, you were doing the right thing, only to find out in the end product you weren't. Well, you don't want to wait all the way to judgment to find out you've been in error. So examine your life by the mirror of God's Word, see where you are, and then if you're not where God wants you to be, be willing to change. Let God's Word change you. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, in the Beatitudes, the very first part of the Beatitudes, is blessed are the meek, blessed are those that are meek, that have put themselves out, that they are, they are not weak, they are self-controlled. And so we have to have a humble spirit in order to receive God's Word like we should. An arrogant person will not let God's Word change them because they have a better idea than God. So we have to get all arrogance, all self-pride out of us before we can be the proper servants of the Lord. We can't come to God with a full house and say, okay God, you can come in if you, if you can find room. No. God wants our house to be empty. He wants us to be empty. And He will fill us with the things that we need. And so um, you know, that is the attitude we hope that you have tonight as we undergo a study of God's Word. This program is a live program. It's one of the few live programs that is still out there. And as a result of that, you'll hear me cough, you'll hear me clear my throat, and I'll try to do that as calmly as I can and without it disturbing you or grossing you out. But it is a live program, and uh, you might hear me sneeze too. I'll try not to stifle that also. But again, that's part of live TV. And because it's a live TV, you are able to call in and be a part of this program if you would like to. The call operators are standing by right now. And we'd like for all of our watchers tonight and all of our viewers to do something for us. We're trying to see about how far out we get from here and uh, about what type of uh, scope of audience we are having. And uh, we're just kind of doing a little bit of, uh, you, you can help us with this if you would, and we would appreciate it if you would, not mandatory of course. But if you would just pick up the phone and dial 828-485-5555, and that number is on the right hand bottom corner. Uh, if you would just do that, we would appreciate that. 828-485-5555. And uh, call in and let one of our operators know where you are calling from. If you are from Lincolnton, or if you are from Newton, or if you're from Conover, or if you're from Burke County, or Alexander County, or Ashe County, uh, any of the uh, Mitchell County, any of those places. If you're over toward South Carolina in the Charlotte area, over toward Polkton or Mineral Springs or wherever you, that might be, Cherryville or any of those places, call in and let us know. Denver, just call and let us know where you are call, where you, you are watching from, and we would certainly appreciate that. And uh, again, all you have to do is just tell us where you're calling from, and the operators write that down, and we'll thank you, and we'll, we'll appreciate that. We just had one call for that, and we thank you for doing that. But again, we're, if you are from, uh, if you're somehow catching the program from over in a different state, in South Carolina possibly, or over in uh, Tennessee, or over in uh, Virginia, if you are getting the signal from there, we would certainly appreciate that because uh, it also helped the station here too to know how, how far they're getting out. They haven't asked us to do this, by the way. Uh, but anyway. Uh, you can call in tonight and be a part of the program if you would and ask your question. The callers will screen you before you're put on. Uh, you can ask for a copy of this presentation we're giving tonight or you can ask for a free Bible correspondence course. And we can send that to you on CD now. If you would like to have a copy of that, we can send it to you on CD. You can ask for a free tract. That's a written sermon. You can ask for a map to our building. Asked to be added to the quarterly Beacon's mailing list. Beacon is our monthly bulletin at the Mother Newton Church. You can get free biblical study aids at www.wordandsword.com. 
www.wordandsword.com. And you can call tonight with a biblical question or comment, or just call in and let us know where you're calling from, and we will appreciate that very much. And we will do our best to give you a book, chapter, and verse answer for any Bible question that you have. And once again, we thank you for your time tonight as we go through our study of God's Word together. Now, if you also like us on Facebook, if you follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash word and sword, you can post a question up there and we'll have, we'll discuss the Bible with you or your question there. You can go to www.facebook.com, Newton, North Carolina with Newton capitalized and North Carolina capitalized and Church of Christ. You can follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword. Again, in any of these mediums, you can post a biblical question or comment and receive a biblical book, chapter, and verse answer to, our, to your question. And you can also just email us, and we'll talk about that address a little later in the program. You can email us, or you can just write us a letter. And again, the, the point is we want to be sure that we are making, that, that we are getting your Bible question answered. And that's the most important thing. No need for you to go around wondering what the Bible says or what it means if we can answer that. We may not have all the answers ourselves, but we got a book that does, and you do too. And sometimes we need the help just like the eunuch did. What does the Bible say about what we need to do to be saved? What does it say? Well, in John 12, 48, Jesus said that we must hear Him. God Himself said, Hear me, hear my Son. In Romans 10, 17, we know that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So I can't have faith if I'm not hearing God's Word. Also, we must believe God's Word. That's where faith comes. We hear it and we believe it. It convicts us. And we believe what? John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am He, you'll all likewise die in your sins. Romans 10, 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we believe with our heart. What do we believe? What God's Word says. In Galatians 3.26, we know there that it says that we are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that comes to God must believe He is and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So not only in the first passages we have here is what Jesus says, and then we have it verified by what the Apostles say and the writers of the New Testament. Then we see in Luke 13, 3, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Times of this ignorance God winked at, but now requires men everywhere to come to repentance. And so Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 on the day of Pentecost that we've already studied, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and they would be added to the body of Christ. In Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says that if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And if you don't do that, I'll not confess you before my Father in heaven. In Acts 8, 27 through 39, that we'll study tonight, the Ethiopian eunuch, when he said, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized, was told, if you believe, you can. He said, well, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, following what Romans 10.10 10 says, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In Mark 16.16, 16, Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter says in Acts 2.38, through the Spirit, Repent and be baptized. Romans 6, 4 through 6. Baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We die to sin, we are buried in water, and we are raised to walk a new life. Galatians 3, 27. We put Christ on in baptism, Paul tells us. In 1 Peter 3, 21, Peter again tells us through the Spirit that the like figure, wherein even baptism, doth also now save us. Not the putting, on, the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the interrogation of a good conscience toward God. Now, if we fulfill all of these commandments, we'll be saved. We'll be in right relationship with the Lord. And the Lord will add you to His church, Acts 2 and verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily. You didn't have to be voted in, or didn't have to have a second work of grace. 
This is what you were baptized into Christ for remission of your sins, and you, the Lord added you to His church. And you'll be a Christian. And God expects you to serve God, serve Him faithfully until you die. Revelation 2 and verse 10, be faithful unto death and you receive the crown of life. So if you're not faithful to death, if you're not a faithful Christian, then you're in danger of losing your soul. You can fall away, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22. Now friends, this is what the Bible says a person has to do to be saved. Someone says, well, now preacher, you don't know anything about the Bible because the Bible says that we're saved by grace. Of course it does. And we have a, a chart that we put up sometimes that lists the things that, are, that save us. Some 16 or 17 things the Bible teaches save us, but no one of them saves us by itself. I can't, I can't have grace like God has grace. So the grace of God extends salvation to all of us. It's, it's, it's a gift God is willing to give even though we don't deserve it. We're not saved by works of men, but we are saved through doing the works of God. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now there's no system of works I can develop or that you can develop that'll save your soul. But if we do something that God has commanded us to do, we're doing a work of God, aren't we? And so in that, we're acting by faith and we're being saved by faith. And we're, being, we're, we're responding to the grace that's extended by God to us. And again, they're not exclusive terms, they're not contradictory terms, they work together. Faith saves us, grace saves us, love saves us. We save ourselves, and so on and so forth. The Bible continues to say those things, all these things save us. Faith saves us, but not faith alone. Work saves us, but not works alone. Baptism saves us, not baptism alone. You get the point, I think. So again, we must do all of what God has commanded us to do in order to be saved. Okay? We can't skip steps. Okay? You can't skip steps and say, well, I was saved at this point, or I was saved at that point. We've got to follow what the Word of God teaches us to do. If you have your Bibles tonight, I think you can see here, maybe you can see that in my Bible, but I've got this whole section highlighted. Because the Acts the eighth chapter is a tremendous passage. It is at the point where the church is being persecuted and they're being scattered abroad through Judea and Samaria. And then eventually it'll be the uttermost parts of the world. In Acts 1 and verse 8, we find that that is basically the outline for the entire book of Acts. So in your Bible study, if you will, just go over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And we'll see, ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, talking to the apostles, and ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, there's the first seven chapters, and in uh, Judea and Samaria, that's eight, chapter 8 and following, and unto the uttermost parts of the world, that's the journeys. So that's the division. And if you want to put the book of Acts in that way and look at it that way, that's how it's divided. And so we see there the church is established in Acts chapter 2. We find that 3,000 are added to it. We find 5,000 later are added to the church in Jerusalem. So they have at least 8,000 members there in Jerusalem. It's a big church. In Acts chapter 6, they have a large group and they have a number of widows in it. They're making sure that they're taken care of out of the treasury. The New Testament church is fully functioning from the first day that it's established on the day of Pentecost in the town of Jerusalem. Jesus is the founder. And we see there that the brethren are working together and they're meeting from house to house daily to study God's Word. I want to, want to just camp out here for just a moment to all who may think that, and I'm afraid there's some Christians that think this, that you can obey the gospel and be baptized into Christ and then you don't have to do anything else. Kind of like the denominations have out there that you just have to have faith and give your tithe and you can be a member here. No. The Lord expects some things from His people, just like He did in the Old Testament. Just because you are a child of God or a chosen one of God in the Old Testament does not mean that God gives you a free ride. That was one of the fatal flaws of the, of the uh, people of Israel. They assumed that since they were God's chosen people, and they were, they assumed that since they were Jews by blood, 
that they didn't have to walk by the same rules that others did. But the Lord was very clear to them that just because you are my people and call yourself by my name does not mean that you can do whatever you please. God had stipulations for how they were to obey Him. He had laws for them. And they not only had to worship, they had to worship the right way. And they not only had to worship Him in their serve, or, or serve Him each day, they had to pause at different times in the year and in the week to pay homage to Him. And friends, the idea that you can serve God and go to heaven and come to one church service a week or once a month, I don't know what people are thinking. They must be dreaming if you think that's okay with God. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, and he instituted that the Lord's Supper be taken on every first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, the disciples met together to break bread. Paul preached to them. In Acts 2 and verse 42 through 47, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So the people of the New Testament times were gathering together, and they were worshiping according to God's Word. And they were doing what God's Word teaches, and they were faithful in that. Hebrews 10 verse 25, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Friends, we're, we're just one day closer to eternity right now, aren't we? It hadn't come yet, but it may come before, before this show's over. Are you ready for it? Am I ready for it? You ready to be with the Lord? I've heard of several of my friends this past week. I hadn't had a good week on that, on that score. Several of my friends uh, my, about my age are awaiting death or have already passed. Well, the good part of that is that they're in right relationship with the Lord. The bad part of it is I'm going to miss my friends. You know? But you know, all that just underscores that none of us knows when we're going to die. You have actuaries that try to tell us when we're going to die. They, they set all the insurance charts on how much to charge you based upon a basic figure that comes from the Bible, 70 to 80 years old. Maybe some people live longer than that, some people live less. But the odds are, and they, they set their rates on that, but you don't know. Some people die in car accidents, they die from shootings, they die from just walking down the street doing nothing, and somebody uh, that's broken a law runs into them. These things happen. And what we need to make sure of is that we're ready to be with God. If the Lord came back on Sunday, would you be in a boat or would you be at church services? Would you be playing softball or would you be at church services? Would you be out uh, partying with your friends? Or would you be with the Lord's people on the first day of the week? Where would you be? Now you answer that question. And if you say anything but, I would be with the Lord's people, if you make excuses, say, well, it depends on you know, whether I was scheduled. You know, you, when you obeyed the gospel, you made the utmost commitment to the Lord. And you, any commitment you make after you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, is secondary to your commitment to the Lord to worship Him as you should. So if you sign your kids up for ball, if you sign your kids up for this or that, you can't come back and say, well, I'd have been at church services, except I didn't have any, I, I, my kids had this or my kids had that. What are you teaching your kids? You're teaching your kids that softball means more than Jesus. You're teaching your kids that serving self means more than serving the Lord. That's what you're teaching them. Now you can deny that all you want to. I want you to show me a passage that would say that you are putting God first when you let other things come in the way of your worship to God as you should. There's no passage, is there? If you do have one, call in tonight. And let us know where the passage is that says, I can go to heaven as a Christian and not come to the services of the church. It's just not there. So the Lord expects service. He expects us to serve Him properly. I've heard people say, well, I want the Lord, I want Jesus, but I don't want the church. Well, you can't have it that way. Because Jesus is the head of the body. You can't have the head without the body. You can't have the body without the head. So if you serve the Lord, you're going to serve Him in His church. That's part of how you serve Him. 
Is that the only place you serve Him? Of course not. But it certainly is the place that you serve Him collectively with your other brethren in a local capacity. That certainly is. Why the Lord purchased not only your pardon at Calvary, He purchased the church with His blood. The blood purchased the church and purchased your pardon. So you can't separate them. Okay? Well, in Acts 8, turn there if you will. Have you got it? Let's just go through from verse 1 and let's look at it. Saul was consenting unto his death. Stephen, again, it ends with Stephen being stoned. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church at Jerusalem. And they were scattered around throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So Acts 8 begins the opening of the Judea and Samaria section of the book of Acts. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. In Acts chapter 7, I won't read it now, but in Acts chapter 7 a man named Stephen, who was not an apostle, is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a deacon in the church at, at Jerusalem. And notice what it says. He's very strong. He says in verse 51, when he concludes his lesson to the Jews, he says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Like your fathers did, you do too. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they have slain those that showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you've now been the betrayers and murderers of. You've received by the, the law by the dispensation of angels, and you've not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were pricked in their hearts. Now in Acts 2, people were pricked in their hearts, and they submitted to God in baptism. Here, they're pricked in their hearts, and they stone a man to death for preaching Christ. That's pretty sad, isn't it? And they think by killing the messenger that they're going to kill the message. Well, the beautiful thing about how God has planned everything is you can kill every messenger out there and you're still going to have to deal with the book. You'll be held accountable how you've been obedient to the things that are written in the book. That's the basis upon which you're judged. They cast him out of the city, verse 58, and they stoned him and laid their clothes down at a young man's feet named Saul. And they stoned Stephen, and he called upon God and said, Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. What a compassionate man. What a compassionate man. His last words were, don't hold this against them, Lord. Jesus had similar words on the cross, didn't he? They don't know what they're doing. Well, some of those in Acts 2 changed. Not all of them. And perhaps some of these did. I know one of them did. His name was Saul. Although Saul did not throw a rock as far as what's recorded, did not throw a stone, he was complicit in the stoning of, these people, of, of, this, of this godly man. He consented to it. He says he did. And he didn't stop it, and he could have. And he watched the life be, be pummeled out of a man and did nothing about it. And he did it in a good conscience. So that tells us something, folks. Is it possible for a person to be honestly wrong? It is, isn't it? Possible for me to be honestly wrong? And I'll admit that. It's possible for you to be honestly wrong. Now, is it possible for people to be dishonestly wrong? Yes. Is it possible for someone to be ignorantly wrong? Yes. But notice the last word after all the modifiers you want to put in front. At the end of the day, it's still wrong. Regardless of whether you're sincere or insincere or ignorant, you're still wrong when you don't do what God's Word has said. Ignorance is no excuse. Motive, honest motives is no excuse. Dishonest motives certainly is no excuse. We all have the same Word. And we are held accountable for whether we obey it or not. Now, friend, this man Saul will later become the Apostle Paul. 
How could this hardened man stand there and watch the light? He thought that Stephen was an enemy of God, and he was wrong. He was the Lord's agent. He was the Lord's spokesman. And Saul had to live with the consequences of what he did here, even though later he does what's right. Now let's look at Philip's activity here. They went everywhere, verse 4, preaching the gospel. Those that were scattered went everywhere preaching the gospel, preached Jesus. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ there. <coughs> Pardon me. And the people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip said, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. Now what was a miracle for? Not to convert somebody but to help somebody believe that the words that were being said were true. Okay? Then let's look. And the people with one accord gave heed to these things. There was great joy, verse 8, in the city. And there was a certain man named Simon who had bewitched people through sorcery and gave out that he was some great one, David Copperfield, and to whom all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man has the great power of God. He must have been a tremendous magician. But it was a trick. He was good at it. David Blaine does some fantastically, um, th some fantastic things that I don't understand yet. But he'll tell you it's a trick. Okay. And, but these people, again superstitious, thought that this man had the power of God. So when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, so here's Philip preaching the kingdom. Okay? Now to those of you who don't think the kingdom's here yet, here's Philip in Acts 8 preaching the kingdom. What's he preaching about the kingdom? That it's yet to come? No, it's here. Okay? It's established in Acts chapter 2. It's the church. All right, he was pre preaching things concerning the kingdom in the name of Jesus. And they were baptized, both men and women. Doesn't say how many. But what were they? What happened? They were baptized. Why were they baptized? Because that's what puts you into Christ. That's what puts you in the kingdom. Okay. So here's a man preaching and people being baptized. Simon himself believed. Here's this sorcerer, this magician, who believes what's being said, and he he obeys it. When he was baptized. He stayed with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that, he were, that were being done. When the apostles that were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the Word of God, they sent Peter and John down, and when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit." All right. So these people were baptized, but they had not received the Holy Spirit, had they? And this was the gifts, the different measures of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14 pardon me, through chapter 12 through 14, that they had not received the gift yet. Now how was it bestowed? By the laying on of the Apostles' hands. Not by some baptismal regeneration in the Spirit. Not by Holy Spirit baptism. By the laying on of the Apostles' hands. Now, for as yet the Spirit had fallen on none of them. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He laid their hands on them and they received the Spirit. And when Simon saw this, the laying on of the apostles' hands that the gift was given, he offered them money and says, give me this power so that I can lay hands on people so they can receive the Holy Spirit. And he was ready to purchase that. And what was he told? This is not a parlor trick. Peter's indignant here. Peter said that your money perish with you. You have thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money? You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart's not right in the sight of God. You repent of thy wickedness and pray God so that the thought of thine heart might be forgiven you, for you're in the gall of bitterness and the bond of sin. Now this man was just saved, but he's in sin again. Now to those of you that don't think you can fall away, what are you going to do with that? The man was in sin, wasn't he? And he was told to do what? Repent and pray. He's a child of God. 
He wasn't told to go be baptized again. He was told to repent and pray, and that's what the child of God does, the person who's been baptized. So Simon says, you pray for me, that none of these things that you have spoken come on me. And they testified and preached the Word of God and returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in the villages of Samaria. And then the angel of the Lord, verse 26, spoke to Philip and says, Go toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, there was a man of Ethiopia. Okay? A man of Ethiopia. Now, how far had he traveled from Ethiopia to Jer Jerusalem, and why? Because he had a desire to serve God. He was evidently a proselyte Jew. Now, a proselyte Jew was a Gentile. An Ethiopian would have been a Gentile from over in Africa area, continent of Africa. And he had traveled as a proselyte. He had traveled to Jerusalem. He had adopted the Jewish religion. Although he knew that a proselyte could never go in the temple, there was a court of the Gentiles that they could stand outside. And also, as a eunuch, he could not go in the temple. So he had status as a Jew, but he was lacking credentials that, helped, that kept him from being like the rest. So he goes up anyway. And he worships in Jerusalem. And the eunuch was on his way back, going to Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He had charge of her treasury, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. Verse 28. And he was reading as he went along Isaiah the prophet. Now someone says, how can a person read while they're driving a chariot? Well, he probably wasn't driving it. He had a driver as a person with credentials like this. And he was returning, sitting in the chariot, reading Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and join yourself to this chariot. And Philip ran to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And here's the, here's the progression. Verse 30, Do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand? Now remember what we've said about a convert. Let's go back to our notes here and to our charts and let's see what a convert really is. A convert is someone who has changed, who has had a religious conversion. All right, to be converted is to be changed over. All right, now, for instance, what is water when it happens to freeze? or when it happens to boil. It either becomes a vapor or becomes a solid, right? But it changes form. When water changes to ice or steam, we say it's been converted, okay? It's different from the original. So what it was, it is no more, you see? That is conversion demonstrated very clearly, all right? So we see there that that's what happens. A total change takes place. It alters the chemical nature or property, such as water, and to alter for more effective utilization. Okay? In Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, Assuredly I say that unless you are converted and become like little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So uh, whoever humbles himself like this little child will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So you must be converted to be pleasing to God. We've already studied in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Be changed. So the Word of God is changing us. We hear it, it pricks our hearts, we learn what we should do, and we keep hungering and thirsting after it so we can keep being all that God wants us to do. In James 5, 19 through 20, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns, that word is convert, a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and prevent or cover a multitude of sins. 
Friends, when you tell somebody about Jesus Christ from the Bible, and they are obedient as God says they are to be through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, then you've, you've prevented a lot of sins. You've kept that person from jeopardizing their soul any further by presenting God's Word to them. Now they have, of course, made the choice and they have to implement what you've, what you've said from God's Word. But you have prevented by exposing them to what's right. You help them to always forever know what the right way is. A convert is not merely a person who changes actions. In Luke 15, 11 through 24, the story of the prodigal son. He had a change in knowledge, a change in conviction, a change in allegiance, and a change in thinking and will. He had a change in commitment, resulting in a change of relationship and identity. And he had a change in who he was, and how he talked, and where he went. And what he would do, he no longer pursued pursuit of riotous living. He came out of that, and he came back home to his father and lived godly, like his father had trained him to do to start with. Friends, you can't keep behaving like you did in the world just because you've been baptized into Christ. You have to be a committed person, all in. In Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple or the fool. Now, in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, and we're now into verse 30 here, Philip is instructed by an angel and the Holy Spirit to go talk to this man. In verse 30, watch the progression. If you got your Bibles, let's look at this and go ahead. By the way, it's not sinful to mark in your Bible, okay? <laughs> Take your pencil and put the steps here. Number one, he ran hither to him and heard him read the scriptures in Isaiah. Now Philip finds out where he is. Where is this man reading? And he asked him a question. Do you understand what you're reading? Well, we might ask the same question tonight. Do you understand what you're reading? In Isaiah 53, that's the passage that Isaiah the prophet uh, wrote through the Spirit. And what he wrote was that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be one who would come. And he would be meek. And he would take on the sins of all mankind. By his stripes we would be healed. And we know that that exactly occurred. He will be led as a lamb dumb before the shearer. He will not open his mouth. And we know that all of these things happened when he was crucified. And Philip is preaching these things to the eunuch. And the eunuch is finding out who Isaiah is talking about. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch replies in verse 2, number, the second point here. How can I except someone guide me? And he desired that Philip, he invited Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. The place where he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before the shearer. And he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who will declare his generation, for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, I, I, I beg you, or I pray of you, does the prophet speak of himself or of some other man? And so Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached to him what? Preached to him Jesus. Now notice that Philip is preaching Jesus to the eunuch. And the eunuch will respond to the preaching by believing and obeying the gospel. But it says that Philip preached Jesus. Now, friends, there are most of you who are watching tonight, I would venture to say, would say that, well, that's, that's what was done with me. Somebody told me about Jesus. Well, okay. But what response does the Bible say an honest soul has when Jesus is preached to them. 
Well, let's read. Let's read on. And as they went on his other way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? How did he know that? Because Jesus was preached to him. In the preaching of Jesus is the preaching of baptism. Now, what is baptism? Baptism is where the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to redeem men from sin, and it is administered in water. Now, I've heard people make convoluted efforts to try to say this was Holy Spirit baptism, but I want to, I, I defy you here. I, I, I challenge you, not being ugly, but I, I, I just want to challenge you here about this. Why did he say, here's water? What does water have to do with your salvation? Somebody says, hey, that's you Church of Christ people. You think a lot of water. Well, no, the, the, the Lord thinks a lot of water. He thinks that water is essential. And, when, and, and it's obvious when the eunuch, it dawns on him that what's being said here about Jesus, remember Jesus and John baptized. And they baptized in view of the kingdom coming. Now, Jesus didn't baptize himself. But notice here that there are those that are denying that baptism has anything at all to do with your salvation. Now, friends, some of you who are watching tonight, you probably will say, well, I've been baptized. Why were you baptized? Were you baptized because you were already saved by faith? If you were, you weren't baptized right. Were you baptized for the remission of sins? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, is that why you were baptized? When you were baptized, did the Lord add you to the church or were you voted into a denomination? You see, this, what's the difference? Somebody said, well, what's the difference, preacher? Well, the difference is one's scriptural, one's not. And that matters to God, doesn't it? It matters to you, should about whether you have obeyed what the Bible says or obeyed what your denomination teaches. Obeying men or obeying God? You choose. Acts chapter 4, should we obey God or men? You answer that. Well, the obvious answer is you, if you want to please God and go to heaven, you please God, right? Well, that's what this man did. He, they came to the water. He's heard Jesus preach to him. They come to the water. He says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And I want you to notice that Philip doesn't say, well, you just jump right in. I'll baptize you. Let me get you wet as soon as we can, because we're going to make sure that we get you wet. No. That water is going to, that water just must be absolutely pure, and it'll clean you up. And that water salvation will take care of it. And he didn't say that either. He said, if you believe, you can. Now here you have faith tied with baptism. And not faith only, not baptism only, and not confession only. But you have faith, confession, and baptism all in one passage here with one person. All brought up. Why did he have to confess? Because he didn't even know who the prophet was talking about to start with. Now he does. After he's heard the explanation of Isaiah 53 and Jesus preached, he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I, somebody says, how long was that sermon? I don't know. But the man had a receptive heart, and it doesn't take a long sermon if you've got a receptive heart, does it? And the man said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Philip said, well, that, based on that, he said, uh, they, he commanded the chariot to stand still. Watch this. They went down into the water. What'd they do? They, both of them, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Watch this. And they came up out of the water, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Why did he rejoice? Because his sins had been washed away, friends. He was no longer a sinner. He was a blood-bought child of God. Somebody says, well, what did he do? 
Well, if you notice by implication, he went back to probably went back to Ethiopia and started worshiping with the people, converted some people, and worshiped in the church in Ethiopia. That's just what Christians do. See, remember they're going to go all over the world preaching the gospel. Or he may have left Ethiopia and come to some other place. But remember, the man is traveling a thousand to fifteen hundred miles. And he is absolutely elated of what's happened here. He's thrilled to death. His trip was better after this. The man is sitting in his chariot and he's reading. And a man comes up and says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, I sure don't. I need somebody to help me. He said, I'll help you. And he did. He was the greatest friend the man had. Notice that the eunuch didn't say, get out of my face, I'll find my own way to heaven. He didn't. Here is that good soil that Jesus talked about. That soil that is ready to hear, ready to receive the seed. My wife and I are trying to plant grass in our yard. We've been, plant, we've been planting grass in our yard for, oh, seven years. In the same place, and we just can't get it to come up. We have nurtured it. We have done what we can. We put, we brought new soil in, and we're working with the soil. And now this year, finally, it looks like we might get some grass to grow where it hadn't grown before. But I'll tell you what, it's taken a whole lot of soil preparation. Well, what was wrong with it to start with? Why wouldn't the seed take? Because the soil was bad. And friends, maybe your soil of your heart is bad right now. But that doesn't mean that it can't be improved. And maybe you're not ready to be baptized into Christ right now. But you can start improving your soil by coming and hearing God's Word preached. Or by studying God's Word in your home. And working on making that soil better. You don't have to just say, well, I'm just bad soil. Oh, no. no. Or I'm so bad that God would never have anything for me to do. Oh, no, no, no. You start improving that soil. You don't just submit and say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll never be saved. I'll never be able to go to heaven. Well, friends, all of us, if we, if we, when we go to heaven, if any of us make it, it's going to be through the grace of God and His long-suffering, His mercy, and not because we deserve it. But it will not also be unless we obey what He has told us to do. So we have an obligation to be obedient to what he has told us to do. Now friends, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch could be your story tonight. You're not riding in a chariot, but I imagine that there are some passages of Scripture you don't understand. I imagine there are things that are being taught in your denomination that you're confused about because they didn't used to be taught. I would imagine or venture to say that if you are a regular church-going denominational person, that you're going to a church that's named something that the Lord does not call His church, that it is founded by a man, that it is not, was not founded on the day of Pentecost, and that it is not following the pattern of the New Testament church. I'd venture to say that if you're in a denomination tonight, Maybe you're in Elevate, or maybe you're in the new one that's here in Hickory that flies flags out in front of their building. They had a man smoking a cigarette the other day inviting people in, and he had, he had a brown bag by him too. But I'm sitting there going, wow, this is the best they have. But I tell you what, all of us are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, and every soul needs to be saved, friends. But the Lord Jesus Christ did not come to save us in our sins. This idea that many of the community churches have, you just come as you are, you don't have to do any changing, is as foreign to what the message of the gospel is as anything. You couldn't get further from the message of Jesus. In John 6, in, ver in the whole 6th chapter, remember those that had followed Jesus for the loaves and fishes, they continued to follow Him. And when Jesus preached a message that they weren't ready to hear, they, they were ready to leave, and they began to leave. And Jesus asked the question, will you leave me too? He didn't say, go change the message. I didn't mean to run them off. 
Go tell them they don't have to change anything. No, the Lord was very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you have to be poor to be rich in my kingdom. Jesus said, you have to empty yourself in order for me to be able to fill you up. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. He didn't tell the people what they wanted to hear. He told them the truth. And they were commanded, and they were, his words were such that they demanded a changed life. And they knew if they followed Jesus, they would be different people. They couldn't live like they used to. And this eunuch knew that also. So friends, if you're here watching tonight, and you are the eunuch, and you're looking at this man's story, and you're saying, you know, he's a lot like me. I'll tell you what, folks, he's a lot like a lot of us. And this is the, an example of a man who was ready, willing, and able to receive this beautiful message about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit recognized that and sent Philip to teach him. Jesus said, Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Friends, who knows but that this TV program tonight may be the very means by which you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you will have a choice just like the eunuch. We're preaching Jesus tonight. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, but He came forth on the third day. And He lives, reigns, and rules over His kingdom from heaven right now. His kingdom is the church. He purchased it with His own, body, own blood. And Jesus purchased the pardon for your sins with His blood. No amount of anything you could do would merit your salvation. And even after we have done all the works of God, we don't deserve or demand that Jesus saves us. It is through His grace that we are saved. He chooses to save, but now rec recognize that He promises to save those who love Him and obey Him. So He's going to keep His promise. He will save you. And that's a great message. Maybe you're watching tonight, and maybe you're in a depression. Maybe you have tried, and maybe you're a person who has anxieties that are just eating you up. Now I know some of these things are, are medically, and need to be medically treated. But a lot of anxiety is brought on by guilt. And maybe you just are loaded with guilt over the sins of your life. And you, you, you don't know, maybe you've tried drugs and alcohol and all that to run from them. And the Lord says, turn around and face them. Face your sins. Look at my book. Turn from them. And I come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And I'll give you rest. You take my yoke on you and you learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your soul. My yoke's easy and my burden is light. So the invitation of the Savior that died to purchase your pardon is there for you tonight, right now. And it's just a short phone call to let us know if you need help being obedient to the gospel of Christ. Or if you want to study, if maybe your soil is not good, the soil of your heart, and you want to nurture it to make it more able, to maybe you're trying to rebuild a conscience that you are destroying slowly by the way you're living. I got hope for you. The message of God's Word sown in a heart that wants to change can do untold wonders. God is powerful. His Word is powerful. The Hebrew writer says it cuts coming and going. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it's powerful. The word in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. That word power is dunamis. 
You can kind of see that we get dynamic or dynamite from that word. It is active, it's powerful, and it will destroy what is bad and create a place for something new. That's what the gospel is able to do. But you've got to let it work. You have to let the story of Jesus and the story of the Bible break your heart when you realize that it was your sins that caused Jesus the pain that he went through. It is your sins today that still grieves God. And it is the blood of Christ that saves you from your sins. Friends, when you realize that, <clears throat> say you're a Christian watching tonight, a New Testament Christian, and maybe you are trying to serve the Lord part-time, on your time, when you have time. How in the world could you have such a great gift given for you? And you harden your heart and say, I will give you nothing back. I'll do nothing for you, Lord. You've done everything for me. I may serve you on high occasions, or when I please, or when it's convenient for me, but I'll not give you my whole life. Friends, both of those are atrocious attitudes. The attitude that says, I don't want to hear it all. And the attitude that says, I am your child, but I'm not going to be submissive to you unless it pleases me. Friends, change your life. Be the eunuch and submit. You want to rejoice? Submit to the Lord. We've got a little break time right now that we're going to take. It's 9 o'clock and we're getting ready to start the second part of our program and talking about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus that we just read about who was holding the coats of the people that stoned Stephen. Remember that the Ethiopian eunuch is an honorable man, verse 27. He's a religious man, verse 27. He's a truth seeker, verse 28. He's a humble man, verse 30 and 31 and 34. And he's a ready man in verse 36. And he's convicted in verse 37. But it is only when he is obedient that he is able to rejoice. He's honorable, he's religious, he's a truth seeker, he's a humble man, he's a ready man, he's a convicted man. But he's not a saved man yet. All the things that he has done have brought him unto the Lord, but there is only one thing that happens that puts him in a state where he is able to rejoice. And he rejoices because he's in right relationship with the Lord. And that's when he is obedient in baptism for the remission of his sins, just like Acts 2 verse 38. Then after he is obedient to the Lord, he is a joyful man. Now friends, you might be an honorable person, a religious person even, a truth seeker even, or you wouldn't be watching this program. You're a humble person. You're a ready person. You're a convicted person with what you do, but you are, may be convicted the wrong way. But only until you are an obedient person to all of what God has taught you in the New Testament. Can you be a joyful person? So we ask you, become the eunuch tonight. Now I want you to notice some things that did not occur with the Ethiopian eunuch <clears throat> in this story. Let's look at some things that are not in the text. Come back to me if you will. There is no direct operation of the Holy Spirit on the man. The Lord directs the speaker, but not the subject. So he works with the speaker in presenting the word. But there's no direct operation of the Holy Spirit on the eunuch, except through the words that are spoken. The man's not converted because somebody lays hands on him or because somebody gives him a baptismal measure of the Spirit. He's converted because he hears words to be converted by. Pardon me, I told you that might happen. Uh, excuse me very much. 
He's not told to tell his experience. There have been some of you who have called in and told us your religious experience about how you were saved. We've heard everything from somebody found Jesus in a telephone pole, to Jesus was found in a cloud, to Jesus was found in a pancake. You saw a vision of Jesus and that moved you to do what God says and that's the basis for your salvation. Or your granddaddy was out plowing and the horse stalled up and the snake ran by in front of him and the Lord stopped that horse and that was your religious experience and so that's why you're, you're serving the Lord now. Again, there's no such thing happening here. He doesn't tell us his experience and say, well, I had a religious experience from God. No, God didn't do anything different from him. He did with anybody. He sent the Word, sent a man to preach the Word to him. He wasn't told to pray through. Now, even today in some churches, you're told to come to the bench, come up front, and you pray through, and the Lord, the Spirit will come on you, and you'll be saved. This, that's not here, is it? Nor will you find it anywhere in the Bible where anybody did that. Notice here that after the eunuch was ready to be baptized, Philip didn't say, hold on a minute, I got some folks here with me, we're going to vote on whether we'll accept you or not. No, there was no voting on whether to receive the eunuch or not. They were not told to confess that he was being a sinner, that he was a sinner. He was to repent of his sins, but he was to confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. That's what he was to confess. He already was a sinner. That was pretty clear. He's not told to, when he leaves to, to go to the denomination of his choice. He's not sprinkled. He's immersed in water. <clears throat> I want you to notice something else. When he says, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? <clears throat> Philip did not say, well, what in the world's wrong with you? You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. The Lord's done it all for you. You don't have to do anything. He wasn't told that either, was he? He wasn't told the grace of God's already saved you. Now, friends, if the eunuch was saved by grace only, then the rest of this that's recorded here was for nothing. If the eunuch was saved at the point of grace and by faith, then he was saved without having to confess Jesus as the Savior. Now, you don't believe that, do you? <clears throat> but if you believe in faith only, you believe that. So you need to cut out a few verses out of your Bible. <clears throat> Please don't do that, by the way, because they'll still be there. You just don't get to take a pen knife like Jehoiakim did and tear out the parts of the Bible that, you don't, that don't fit what you want to believe. You're still going to have to listen to it. It's God's Word. <clears throat> but if the eunuch was saved at the point of faith, then he was saved before he confessed. If he, if he was saved just because he was sincere, then he was saved before Philip ever showed up. If he was saved because he was seeking the truth, then he was saved before Philip ever came. Well, again, things that didn't occur here, no direct operation of the Spirit. Well, what about errors and refuting errors that are here? Direct operation of the Spirit on the heart of the sinner is refuted in this passage. In verse 2, verse 3, verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 12. And notice John 16, verse 13, all of these refute the idea of Holy Spirit working on the heart of the person in some way other than through the Word. The Holy Spirit still works today, friends. I was saved by the Holy Spirit. But I wasn't saved by the Holy Spirit working some work in me or coming on me or speaking to me in some way God has not already spoken to me in His Word. Question for you. If the Holy Spirit has to come to you, what will He tell you to do that would be right that the Word of God has not already spoken to? 
Now let's go back. I want to bring this to you. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other doctrine than what ye have received, let him be anathema. What's the Holy Spirit going to tell us to do today? Or tell us that the Word of God does not already address? <clears throat> well, the fact is, the Holy Spirit and God was wise enough to make sure He covered everything He wanted us to know. So you and I can know what we need to do to be pleasing to God and go to heaven. Now, we are enlightened by an understanding of what the Scriptures say. Not by some better felt than told experience, not by some type of story that we make up, trying to get our second work of grace in our lives. Once again, there's errors that are refuted in Acts chapter 8. Calvinism, Baptist doctrine, is refuted in this passage. Well, <clears throat> go back to our, to our um, charts, if you would. Baptism not being a part of the gospel is refuted here. The Catholic doctrine, the Methodist doctrine of sprinkling for baptism is refuted. The idea that baptism is not a part of the message of Jesus Christ being preached is refuted in Acts 8. So we have to be obedient to the Lord <clears throat> And we are only able to rejoice when we do what? When we're baptized in water for the remission of our sins. Is sprinkling okay? Can I be sprinkled to be saved? No. Every one of you who's watching tonight who was sprinkled for baptism, it's not what the Bible teaches. The word baptism itself in the Greek means to immerse, to dip, to plunge beneath something, to engulf over. And Romans chapter 6, if you didn't even have the Greek, would tell you that baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So we die to sin, we are buried in baptism, and we are raised to walk a new life. We are immersed, we are overwhelmed in water. And also, the idea that baptism puts you into the local church is not there. The Lord adds you to His universal church, but you join yourself to a local congregation of God's people that are doing what God says. How do you know they're doing what God says? You weigh what they're doing, you examine what they're doing by the Scriptures. And if they're not doing what the Scripture says, you're supposed to get out of there if you can't change them. Again, the things that occurred in this text, folks, is the gospel was preached. The Ethiopian believed it. He changed his religion. He was not so set in proselyte Judaism that he said, this is it. Now, once, again, let's go back and see why he changed and how what a great message it was. Remember that when you're in Christ, there's no more Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ. This eunuch, who had been rendered an, uh, kind of a secondary citizen with the Jews, one who had to stand outside where everybody else was inside, now he can be equal to everybody else. That's just a great message, isn't it? All standing in the same relationship. He confessed Christ. He was baptized. He went on his way rejoicing. Again, the conversions in the book of Acts that we've gone through so far have shown that people were hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, repenting, confessing Christ, and being baptized in water for the remission of their sins. Well, have you been converted? Not have you been uh, doing the things that just put you in a denomination, but have you been converted to Christ? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And I would venture to say that all who are watching tonight believe that. Have you confessed Jesus Christ as the Son of God? I would imagine some of you have done that too. Have you repented and been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? Now I'd venture to say some of you haven't done that. <clears throat> you 
You may have been baptized to join the Baptist church or baptized to join another denomination, but you haven't been baptized in Christ for the remission of your sins. You may have been baptized because your sins have already been forgiven through faith, and that's not for remission of sins. All right. Well, if you haven't done that, why not? When you hear that the Bible teaches you to do something you haven't done, are you willing to do that? Are you going to be stubborn? Are you able to rejoice and have a peace that passes all understanding, Philippians 4? To rejoice in the Lord always because you're headed to heaven? Are you able to do that? Well, folks, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached in the last hour and 15 minutes here. Have you been obedient to it like the eunuch? Are you willing to? We invite you. And we hope you will be obedient. Now, where are you tonight? You have to answer that question. Have you done what you need to do to go to heaven? Are you a person? Pardon me again. Are you a person that has heard the gospel, believed it, repented, confessed, and been baptized for the remission of your sins? And are you worshiping faithfully with the Lord's people in the Lord's church? you have a new relationship in the Lord? Are you able to rejoice? <clears throat> well, we're going to listen now to what God says in the book of Acts chapter 9. Saul yet breathing out threatenings. Last time we heard of him, is, uh, this man was in chapter 7 when he stood there while they were stoning Stephen. <clears throat> but he's breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And he's on his way to the high priests and gets letters from them to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, talking about Christians, whether men or women, that he might bring them bound back to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, Well, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he was trembling, and he was astonished. And he said, Lord, what will you have me, watch this, to do? Hmm. Curious, isn't it? Why would he ask that? And the Lord said unto him, Get up. Go into the city, and it will be told thee what thou, watch this, must do. It will be told thee what thou must do. Hmm. Curious, huh? And the men that journeyed with him stood speechless. They heard a voice, but they didn't see anybody. So Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord had said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Well, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise, and go into the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays, and he has seen in the vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias said, Lord, I've heard many things of this man, how much evil he's done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. The Lord said, Will you go to him? And he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul, 
Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to you in the way as you came, sent me, that you might receive thy sight and be filled with the Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and he arose, and watch, was baptized. When he received meat, he was strengthened. And Saul was certain days with the disciples at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, and he is the Son of God. And all that heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this the one that destroyed those that called on the name in Jerusalem? And he came to this intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews that dwelt in Damascus, proving that Christ is, the, is uh, that he is the very Christ. And after that, many days were uh, fulfilled. The Jews tried to or took counsel to kill him. They laid wait. And it was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night, led him down by the wall in the basket, and Saul came to Jesus, Jerusalem and essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was really a disciple. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared to him how he had seen the Lord in the way. He had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Christ. And he was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus, and disputing the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. When the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. All right. And the churches had rest, because Saul, the enemy of the people, the ringleader, had been converted. Now, friends, it's a tremendous thing that's happened here. Saul of Tarsus, someone that you and I would not have ever chosen to go and teach. Before his conversion, he's sincere, he's zealous, and he's a persecutor. The how of his conversion is in the text. Let's go back to it. Look, if you will, at Acts chapter 9, verse 3. There shone from heaven a light that, that was from heaven, so he saw something. Verse 4, he heard something. Verse 5, he reacted and said, Who are you, Lord? And then he says, what, Tell me what I should do. Verse 6. And he was told what he should do, go into the city. Now the question comes up, friends, was Saul saved on the road to Damascus? So most people, a lot of people say yes. But he wasn't saved on the road to Damascus. Jesus appeared to the man, but he wasn't saved at that point. Here's an example of somebody that had an experience. Some of you have called in and said, I've had a religious experience. I know I'm saved because the Lord showed Himself to me. So I'm in a pancake or a TV uh, uh, telephone pole. So hold on. Here's a man that really did have something happen like that, really did occur, and he's not saved yet. He's still got to be go to, told to go into the city, and it will be ho told you by Ananias what you shall do. All right? So he saw Jesus, he heard a voice, but he wasn't saved. So he wasn't saved by the experience, was he? But you see, those that believe in experience salvation, they love this text and they try to get it in there. But remember, he wasn't saved by having faith even. He believed that Jesus was the one. He said, I'm, the, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. And what did he say? Who are you, Lord? He said, Who are you, Lord? And notice what he says. He was trembling, and he was astonished. And he said, Lord. Once again, twice he says, Lord. This is a man that up to this point has, in has every intention of either leading people to death, every Christian he could find, or 
being involved in their death himself. He's got credentials to bring women and children to kill or to suffer for being a Christian. And when he sees what's going on, remember he's a devout Jew. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees, later on he tells us. He is an up and coming Jew. And notice he is told right up front that you're my chosen vessel for the Gentiles, but he had not been baptized. He wasn't saved, friends. If he had not been baptized, Acts 22, by the way, turn over to Acts 22, and let's see what, what uh, Paul, in talking about his situation and what happened to him in his conversion, let's see what story he tells in Acts 22, and we'll just read a few verses there. Verse 16, Now why do you tarry? Ananias said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He, tell, he tells his story from verse 6 on down through verse 16 or 17. Now, he goes through the same story. He again reiterates in verse 10 that he had to do something. Now friends, he wasn't told you don't have to do anything because the Lord's done it all for you. He didn't do that. Ananias, verse 12, was a devout man according to the law. And he took him the same hour and he received his sight. And then notice in verse 15, thou shalt be his witness unto all men. Why do you tarry, verse 16? Get up, arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Notice Ananias, directed by God, knew that baptism would wash away this man's sins and commanded him to do that. Acts 9, 1 through 30, Acts 22, 1 through 21, and Acts 26, 1 through 23. Paul reiterates and discusses again and again his conversion. Notice that Paul, be, Saul of Tarsus being converted, immediately riled up the Jews. And the Lord knew that would happen. He told, he told Paul, or told Saul, that you're going to suffer many things for my sake. So he told him right up front, it's going to be a hard road for you. He wasn't told, you serve me and you'll always have a Cadillac or you'll be able to buy you a new plane. And you just get on, get on the phone or you just get in touch with people and tell them to send money to you and you'll be a rich man. He didn't tell him that. He said, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer for being my servant. Again, before his conversion, he was a persecutor. He made havoc of the church, Acts 8, 1 through 3, wreaked havoc on it, cast people in prison, breathed out threatenings and murders in Acts 9, 1 and 2, right. Acts 22, 4 and 5. He was involved in the death of many. He was enraged, Acts 26, 9 through 11, against Christians. He thought they were the enemies of God. Now remember, let's go to Acts 23 for just a moment. And you see that before his conversion, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Philippians 3, 4 and 6 says, he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is of the law, I'm blameless. I was a good Jew, he says. I was about the best one you could find. And I was zealous about it. But he was humble enough to change when he was told he was wrong. In verse Galatians 1, 13 through 14, Paul says this about himself, You have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism behind many of my contemporaries in my own nation. And I was more zealous for the traditions of my fathers than any of them. In Acts 22, he was zealous toward God, 
In Acts 23, I've lived in all good conscience unto this day. I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense, Acts 24, 16, toward God and men. He's always lived a life where his conscience bothered him about what he did, both bad and good. In Acts 26, 9, I myself thought that I must do many things that were contrary to the name of Christ. Now, friends, who is this guy? He's us. He's us. Many of us have offended God terribly. And many people think exactly that they're doing the right thing. And maybe you're one of those. You have followed the religion of your mama and your daddy and your grandma, and you are proud of your church. But you have no clue under the sun as to why you do what you do. You're just following your tradition. Paul was too. He was doing so honestly, and I believe, I don't know you, haven't seen you. You see me, but I can't see back. And I'm telling you that I believe there are many of you watching tonight that are just like Saul. The question is, do you have a heart that will cause you to question and compare what you formerly believed and what you believe now with what the truth says. Here's an example of a religious, devout, zealous, conscientious man who was conscientiously, zealously wrong. He wasn't ignorant of God's Word. He knew the Word. He made his life's goal to know the Word. He was a Pharisee. He was a student of Gamaliel. He was an elite Jew. He was schooled in the religion. That would have meant he had to have many verses set to memory. He knew exactly what the law said. And he had read the things that pointed to Jesus. When Jesus spoke to him, he was ready to listen. In spite of all he had been taught, all he had understood, it all began to come together when a man, watch, a man named Ananias preached to him and told him what he must do to be saved. Now someone says, well, couldn't God have saved? We're not talking about what God could do. How was Saul saved? And what does he tell us how he was saved? He was baptized. It's like you and I. All of us have to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins, for the blood of Jesus to be applied. Can't be saved without the blood. Can't put Christ on without the blood. Galatians 3.27, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Okay? So you can't be saved without Christ. You'd agree with that, right? Right? So you can't, you can't be saved without Christ. So and to get into Christ, you have to let your faith move you to be obedient to Christ, right? So that's what you must do. Now again, he thought, behold, I thought that I should do many things contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Friends, again, he may be you, you may be him. That you're sitting there and saying, you know, I thought I was doing right. But you know, I really haven't thought about instrumental music and why we do it. I've never tried to find in the Bible where that's authorized. I don't know why we just have the Lord's Supper on Easter. I don't know why we have it quarterly. I don't know why we do what we do in my church. I thought it was the right thing to do. Seemed to me like it was good. Well, Saul thought the same things. And he was sincere in it. But friends, I want to tell you something. You can be sincerely lost or insincerely lost. But it's still lost, right? Now, Jesus appeared to him. There was a bright light. There was a voice. There was a voice that said, why are you persecuting me? And who are you? He said, I'm Jesus whom you persecuted. And he was told to go into the city and it would be told him what to do after he asked, what should he do? 
the Lord appeared to him to send him to the Gentiles, and he was blinded. He had an experience where he couldn't see for three days, he had to be led into the city. But in his blindness, let's bring this up, in his blindness he began to see. You ever heard a person blind that says, I've never been able to see better than when I lost my sight? All right. So he began to see when he was blind. The Lord had to make him blind in order for him to see. Now the purpose of Jesus' appearing, it qualified him to be an apostle. Acts 1.22 and 1 Corinthians 9.1, where Paul says, I'm not one whit behind the chiefest of the apostles. One of the qualifications for an apostle had to see Jesus after the resurrection. And Saul did. He sent him to the Gentiles. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. You're going to be a preacher, Paul. Now he was not saved on the road to Damascus. If he was, he was saved before being told what he should do. Acts 9 and Acts 22. He was saved, but he was still miserable. If he was saved on the road to Damascus, because he was still blind, and he still didn't know what to do, and he wasn't able to be what God wanted him to be. He was stay, saved, but he was still in his sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. Wash away your sins, okay? Wash away your sins in Acts 22, 16. He was saved without calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, verse 16. Now Saul's conversion, Jesus sent a preacher to talk to him. He told Saul what he must do. Now friends, that's kind of what we're telling you tonight. Can't be saved without doing the things God says to do. All right? What he must do. He didn't say these are suggestions. He wasn't told to pray or ask Jesus into his heart. He wasn't told he didn't have to do anything because Jesus had done it all for him. He wasn't told to just believe on Jesus, accept him as his personal Savior, invite him into his heart, and go join the church of his choice. Well, if he joined the church of his choice, he'd gone back and been a Jew. Well, he was told that that's wrong. The things the Jews stood for were everything Paul was now stand, going to be standing against. In Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, we see that by the fruits of what Paul did, Saul of Tarsus did, that he repented. He really did change. You talk about a change in a man. It was such a drastic change that people wondered, is he for real? Because he immediately starts preaching. Preaching Christ when he had just now, he had credentials to go to Damascus to kill Christians and lead him to prison. He was told to be baptized calling on the name of the Lord. That word calling on the name of the Lord doesn't say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's appealing to the authority of Christ. Christ authorized baptism, friends. Mark 16, 16. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Well, after Saul's conversion, you have a sincere, devoted, loyal disciple. On fire to serve the Lord, he's forgiven. Acts 22, verse 16, his sins are washed away. He has, he, he has been taught the gospel. The Lord took him aside and taught him individually. He was identified as a Christian and as a devout Christian, and he had a hit on him. The Jews were out to get him. They chased him from town to town from the very outset. He identified himself with local churches when he went different places. After he had established the churches and went back through, he would identify himself, work for three years at Car or two years at Corinth, three years roughly at Ephesus, twice. And he joined himself to the church at Jerusalem in Acts 9, 26 through 29, as a member of that church and worked and preached out of that church. And he saw the significance of the church in the kingdom. He was active in the local church. In Acts 26, verses 19 through 21, Paul relating, I declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and through all the regions of Judea and then the Gentiles that they should repent, that they should turn to God and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons the Jews took me in the temple and tried to kill me. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to even be called an apostle 
because I persecuted the church of God. Notice he persecuted Christ, but here it says he persecuted the church of God. That's the body of Christ. So you persecute the body of Christ, you persecute Christ, don't you? So can you have the head without the body? Paul didn't think so. But notice in verse 10, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not for nothing. But I labored more abundantly than everyone. But it wasn't just me, but the grace of God that was with me. God cared about me. As big an enemy as I was of God's, the Lord still cared for me. And He found a place for me in His kingdom. And Paul was so glad. He was so thrilled. And notice he says, I'm the least of the apostles. Not even worthy to be called an apostle, but he was an apostle, you know. And notice some of the things he, he put up with. He relates them to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11 because some of the Corinthians didn't like what Paul said to them, so they began to attack his apostleship and his authority. He says, are they ministers in talking? He says, I'm, I'm going to speak like a fool. He says, I'm going to tell you some things about me. Are they ministers of Christ? Well, I am more. I am more abundant in labors and stripes above measure. I've been in prison frequently. I've faced death often. Five times from the Jews I received 40 stripes minus one. And three times I was beaten with rods. There was a difference, by the way. One would break bones, one would tear flesh. Once I was stoned. What he had done to Stephen. Three times I was beaten with rods. Three times I was shipwrecked. I was a night and a day in the deep. In journeyings I was often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, and in perils in the wilderness and in the sea, and in perils among false brethren. I've been weary and toiling. I've been unable to sleep often. I've been hungry, I've been thirsty, I've been fasting, I've been cold, and I've been naked. And besides all this, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Think you've had a bad day? Would any one of these things have sent you into a cave and put you in a fetal position? Or put you in a home? But in spite of all these things happening to him, the man kept on going because he realized in Romans 8, 28, that he was more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthened him. And if God was with him, so what if men did anything to him? Bring what you got. Paul eventually died at the hands of Nero for serving the Lord. In 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, at the end of his life, he says, I'm all ready to be poured out like a drink offering. Time of my departure is close. I fought the good fight, and I've kept the faith. I finished the race, and I've kept the faith. And finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not just for me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Well, here's a man that before was an enemy of the Lord. Imagine, if you will, converting the biggest atheist of the time. Imagine, if you will, converting the, great, the greatest Ayatollah in the Mideast, biggest enemy of, of righteousness that you could find. That's been done, by the way, folks. I know personally of some situations that have happened that I know personally about. In the Philippines, there was a chieftain, a Muslim chieftain of one of the tribes there. He was deeply Muslim. He was a Sunni Muslim. And he listened to the message of Jesus Christ. It broke his heart. He cried, and he broke down, and he was baptized into Christ. I know the man that baptized him. And now he is preaching Christ Jesus. He gets a lot. He's had his life threatened many times. But he's still preaching. I know of one, a man down in Mexico who was in, in one of the, the biggest Pentecostal movements down there. He was kind of the Pope of the Pentecostal church in Mexico. 
sat in my front room in Texas and I asked him, I said, why did you ever think you could work miracles or talk in tongues? He said, I never did. Then how could you have taught others to do it? He said, it's what my church told me to do. And I did it with a good conscience. I didn't think it mattered. Could you ever do a miracle, I asked him. He says, no. And I knew I couldn't. But it's what I was told to teach. He said, and then he, he, he broke down. He says, and I am so sorry I taught so many. You know what he did? He made, an, he made it his goal when he would go into a city, the first place he'd go, to the Pentecostal churches. And they knew him. And he was able to preach and convert many and one of the things he would do is preach Christ first. And then he would say, when somebody would say, be real skeptical, he said, I want to tell you, I was just like you. You know, Paul later does that with the Jews. They are ready to kill him, and he, the Romans are protecting him. And he says, take me back in among them. And he starts his speech. He says, I was just like you. I understand why you feel the way you do against me. But I want to tell you what changed me. And he had a great effect on those people. Not all of them. He went from adversary to advocate. From enemy to defender. From destroyer to builder. From a persecutor to a persecuted. Again, the message of faith, repentance, confession, and baptism permeates the New Testament over and over and over again. Salvation is not inherited. You're not saved because you're taught by some popular teacher. You're not saved just because you're religious and you're sincere. Sincere people can harm Christ and His church. And they can do so sincerely. Thinking they're doing the right thing. Thinking they're somehow serving the Lord. But they can be sincerely His enemy. You see in these examples we've used tonight that neither the eunuch nor Paul were saved by faith only. A penitent person who believes the truth can have their sins washed away in the waters of baptism, friends. Converted people are those that are devoted to Christ and His cause. And they are fully sold on it. And they will do whatever the Lord asks them to do. Those faithful to Christ may indeed suffer a lot of things. But if they're faithful, the Lord will reward them, just like Paul said. What kept him going in the midst of death, bobbing up and down like a cork in the ocean, shipwrecked, a night and a day in the deep? What kept him going? It wasn't that everything went smooth all the time. Is that it didn't. And the Lord was still there. And he never cursed God, blamed God. He just went on doing what was right. Friend, tonight, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Have you confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Have you been repented and been baptized, having your sins washed away in the blood of Christ, Acts 22, 16? Like Saul, why, why, why are you tarrying? Get up and be baptized even tonight. Are you zealously serving the Lord or zealously serving men, friends? What is it? We have a question that came in, and we're going to read it here. Does a woman need to cover her head when she is praying? Well, what does the Bible say? And we don't have a name here, but I hope you're still listening. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And we'll just give a brief summary here. If you would like some material sent to you, please call back and give your address and your mailing address to one of the operators. We will not spam you, by the way. You don't need to be concerned about that. We'll send you the material. We will not continue to hound you in any way whatsoever. You've asked a question. It's a good question. It's a Bible question. And I came up from during a time when most, most women, if they covered their heads, they were usually Catholic. And they had a veil. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as you read the text of 1 Corinthians, you see that there are a number of things that are talked about in 1 Corinthians 
that are troubling the church. One of them is here in chapter 11, where you had women who had spiritual gifts. They have abuse of the Lord's Supper also in 1 Corinthians 11. But in the first part of the chapter, you had women who were involving themselves in the display of spiritual gifts, both in and outside of the, of the, of the local church. Now, the custom of the day at Corinth was a loose woman, a woman of the street, was one who would not have a sign of subjection at that time. At that time, it was sort of like what we see today, the burqas, uh, where there was a covering that only kept the eyes exposed. It was called a catacalupto in the Greek, and that meant something that hangs down the face. So it was a covering that only exposed the eyes. But the prostitutes at the heathen's temple not only wouldn't wear those, they would shave their heads. So it was a custom thing to wear it if you were a good woman. Now, like the prostitutes at the heathen temples, many of the people in the body of Christ, the godly ladies in the body of Christ who had spiritual gifts equal with the men, were assuming that they could take off their coverings, uh, their outside show, and that they could do that because they had gifts equal with men. Now there are several things that are talked about to the women in 1 Corinthians 11. One of them is that they are to be quiet in the assemblies. They were speaking out in the assembly. Now whether they had a spiritual gift or not, they were told to be quiet in the assembly. That was an abuse that was being addressed by Paul, reported to him in 1 Corinthians 1 by the house of Chloe. So he tells them, he says, you do not take your covering off. He's not telling them when to wear the covering, he's telling them that they shouldn't take it off when they're serving the Lord. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 11 and verse 1, he says, first of all, in verse 3, there are some, this, this is something that is binding for all time, and that is the order of subjection. Now, because the woman had a sign of subjection on her head to show that she was subject to her husband, because he, she had an equal gift like his didn't mean she could take it off. He, she, she, but now verse 4 shows who he is talking to, a praying or prophesying woman. Now there was an inspired prayer, 1 Corinthians 12, nine of them listed there in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. All right, nine spiritual gifts. Praying was one of those, the spiritual gift of prayer, and I believe that's what he's addressing here. If you had a spiritual gift of prayer, you were, to, you were a woman who had a gift, a spiritual gift, and you were to still keep your covering on and also prophesying. Now that is always, prophesying is always something that was, that was uh, an inspirational thing, guided by God. Well, these are women that have these gifts. Today, you ask the question, uh, does a woman need to, care, to cover her head when she's praying today? Well, first of all, the command was to a praying and prophesying woman. Somebody says, well, we don't prophesy, but we do pray. Well, of course we do, but it's not an inspired prayer, like 1 Corinthians chapter 12 addresses. Well, the time is getting away from us tonight, but I am going to deal with this until we do have to go, because it's an important question. Many Christians do have this question. I'm assuming that if you ask this question, you're probably a Christian. But let me ask you, 1 Corinthians or 1 Thessalonians. Notice that Christians in general, men and women, are told to be instant in prayer. Now, whatever is talked about in 1 Corinthians 11 for the woman not to do, and that is to take her covering off, the man is also talked about. Now, can a man pray with his hat on? Now, someone says, well, no, 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 not, well, now, wait a minute. Is his prayer acceptable to God with a hat or without one? Somebody says, well, he's, he's supposed to take his hat off when he prays. Well, we take our hat off when the flag goes by. We take, now, does that mean you're not, you're not a, a person? No, it might be a bad sign from society, see the custom thing, but it's not something that would hinder your prayers from God. 
when you're in, a, a soldier in the battlefield, a man doesn't have to take his helmet off to pray to God, does he? Nor does a woman have to take a, a covering off or, ha or put one on to pray. Our prayers are not contingent on some outside act that we do. We might just as well ask here in keeping with this, a woman who has had to shave her head because of cancer, does she have to have something on her head to pray to God and it be received? No. No. A man who wears a toupee, does he have to remove it when he's praying? No. See, he's not talking about that in 1 Corinthians 11. He's talking about a special circumstance of a praying and prophesying woman and wants to know whether the custom of keeping the hat on or keeping the covering on is something that they are alleviated from because they have a spiritual gift. He says, no, you're not. You keep it on in those circumstances. I've told several people that customs are to be observed because it bothers the effectiveness of, of the teaching sometimes. If I went to Japan, for instance, with my wife, she would have to walk behind me. If we had children with us, they would have to walk behind us. Or people would automatically assume that I didn't have control of my house, that I wasn't the head of my house. Therefore, they wouldn't listen to the gospel, okay? So I would abide by the custom because he says several times. Now, there are ladies that believe that they should put something on their head. That's no problem, but you cannot bind that on every person. It may be a personal thing that you feel compelled to do, but it's not something you have to do for your prayers to be acceptable to God. Now, we do have a tremendous amount of material that if you would like to call in and leave your message or would like to go on one of the venues that we have and let us know what your, what your uh, thoughts are. Again, we're going to go back to our charts here. We invite you to attend the Assemblies of the Church at uh, Newton or any faithful church in the area, 656 St. James Church Road. Also, we want you to know that this, is, this program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. There's the contact information. The lady that's asked the question or the person's asked the question, if you'll go to these venues and, and uh, call us, and we'll be glad to give you information, more information on this vital subject. Thank you again. Come back on August the 6th, 8 p.m., and we'll study God's Word together once again. Thank you again for inviting us and giving us the privilege of being in your home tonight. We hope that we have learned God's Word. Obey it. Become a Christian. Why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Thank you and good evening.